Given what you've just heard about the newsroom, as you can imagine, editors play a really important role in trying to think about how news gets created. But a lot of the newer forms of information out there don't actually have the same kinds of editorial norms. What happens when you're looking at something on, say, a blog, or you're looking at something um, that's on a non-traditional news site, right? Well, that might be going through a similar editorial process. It might be based on reporters who are going out and doing the legwork of determining you know, who they should be talking to, what is news, what are the key elements, et cetera. But it may also just have been written by somebody who has a particular opinion and wants to get it out there. And so figuring out that is gonna be a critical piece to understanding what's going on in the contemporary environment and to assessing the accuracy of a given piece of news. So editors play this critical role then in the newsroom, right? What editors do is they take a look at what journalists bring in, they check that it's accurate in various ways, shapes, and forms, they ensure that the information that is being um, printed is the best information that can, and they in practice also do another role which is limiting what it is that ends up coming across to people at the end of the day. So if you think about the news environment as it was 30, 40 years ago, if you wanted to watch news on television in the 1960s, you had three options. You could watch on ABC, you could watch on NBC, and you could watch on CBS. If you wanted to watch Hogan's Heroes, you might inadvertently tune into the news for a little while before you ended up being able to see the show you came to see. In that environment, right, the news is sort of built for everybody. Why? Because it doesn't make sense to make one news for this group of people and another news for this group of people, right? Instead, you end up having sort of a single packaged product of news that looks pretty similar across the different outlets. That news is also uniformly expensive to produce and expensive to disseminate. And what that means is that if you're going to produce news, in that era, you're gonna to need to be a pretty large organization. An organization that can afford either to have rights to broadcast airwaves, or an organization that can afford to distribute a newspaper to a large portion of a city, because that's how people hear things. If you're gonna do that, you also then have a reputation to uphold. Because if you're going to be the distributor for an area, and you can only support so many distributors of that kind in a particular area, um, that distributor needs to show that it's credible in some way, shape, or form, that it's doing what it should be doing, that it's holding the right people accountable. In contrast, in the contemporary era, there are a whole lot more ways that you can get news. This began in part in the 1990s when we saw the explosion of cable and we started to see different cable channels put news on, but it exploded even more with the internet. And what we see on the internet now is far more different places to go get news than existed 20 or 30 years ago. So what are the implications of that? Well, the implications of those changes are that when you want to see news today, you're not necessarily going to be seeing news that was created for everybody, at least in a region, if not nationally. Um, it means that the news that you're going to end up seeing today um, might be created by a smaller outlet. Um, it might be created by an outlet that has an interest in taking a particular partisan side of an issue. Another point here that's relevant is how journalism has changed. So if you think about what it meant to be a journalist 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you were working in one of these big newsrooms, right, where you were working underneath an editor, you were doing the kinds of processes um, that we just heard about. And as you were doing those kinds of processes, you were being paid by the newsroom itself, right? There were relatively few journalists, at least in any given area, um, and they were covering things with a strong sense of professional norms. Today, if you want to publish something that looks like a news story, it's not going to cost you very much. Right? You don't need to buy ink by the barrel to get a lot of people to see whatever it is that you've written. And that distinction ends up being critical here. Because 
if anybody can publish, if anybody can take on this role of watching what's happening and being a citizen journalist, instead of necessarily a traditional paid journalist by a newspaper, you're going to end up with some systemic changes in the media environment. These aren't all bad changes. Some of the changes that we end up seeing are downright positive, right? We can appreciate the fact that there's now news that caters to different groups of people in society, right? News is no longer homogenous. It's no longer as white as it used to be. It's no longer as upper middle class as it used to be. Um, it's no longer as this guy talking in front of the camera looking exactly like this as it used to be. But that change in news also comes with a change in norms and a change in editorship. And that means that instead of news organizations that take the core responsibility for determining what it is that's quality versus what's not necessarily worth broadcasting, basically everything today is going to get published. And the challenge that that initiates is that instead of being able to rely on an editor to figure out what's worthwhile and what's not, it's now your job. You have to figure out what's quality, what's worth attending to, what's serious information, and what's not real, fake news, alternative facts, etc. And that is a real challenge leveraged on the consumer that wasn't there previously. Defining what is and isn't a journalist today is nearly an impossible task. In the past, you had this easy ability to say, well, it's the person who's paid by this particular news organization who does this kind of job and writes stories for them. But now I can submit an article to a lot of online publications. You can do so. Um, they may or may not go through an editorial process. And at the end of the day, they may get published. right? And it's not just this sort of alternative approach of writing opinions that used to exist, but they can actually serve as core stories within a news outlet. right? CNN allows iReports right, which lets ordinary people upload their own video of whatever's going on. These kinds of changes, again, democratize in some way in the sense that they allow more people to be part of the newsmaking process, but they also, again, functionally shift the burden from the professionals to amateurs, right, um, and functionally shift how it is that people need to figure out what's worthwhile and what's not from the producers of news to the consumers of news. Social media is going to come in and compound this whole problem. And the way that it does it is instead of going to a credible news source that you believe in to go find your news, now news is coming to you. More and more of the news we're all encountering is being encountered inadvertently as we scroll through our Facebook feed to figure out whose birthday it is today um, or what people did that was interesting. And what we end up finding there is not necessarily the top of the line highest quality news outlets all the time. So if I scroll through my Facebook feed, for instance, yeah, some of my friends will post stuff from the New York Times. But some of them will also post from a lot less reputable sites, the Infowars and Occupy Democrats of the world. These kinds of sites sometimes will provide useful real news and sometimes are going to provide stuff that isn't necessarily going to be backed up by the kind of journalistic evidence that was the norm in the past. And when they appear there in your Facebook feed, and they're endorsed by one of your friends, that message that's coming across in that particular piece of media has additional credibility. Because, oh, John endorsed this, right? John said this was a worthwhile thing for me to read. So I'm going to go look at it, right? That's going to make it a lot more challenging. Another thing that's going to layer onto that is the notion of clickbait. So if you look at the headlines as you go down your Facebook feed, they don't look like news headlines did, again, 10, 20 years ago. They're, in, they're designed to encourage you to click. Why? Well, it's a pretty simple advertising revenue model where what these uh, news organizations want to do is they want to draw you to their web page. Because if you go to their web page, you see the ads that have paid to be on their web page. And as you see those ads, they earn money. This is fine. It's not necessarily all that different from what newspapers did in the past. 
right? What paid for traditional newspapers? Well, it wasn't the reporting that paid for itself. It was a combination of subscriptions and the fact that newspapers had classified ads and a bunch of ads throughout the actual text, right? That was a big portion of the revenue model. But what's, what's different right now is because your attention is being grabbed by these different sources. What they're trying to do is find something that will get you to click on it. Um, again, this has a number of pernicious effects, right? If the news that gets shared and the news that people read is the most click-worthy, the newsmaker has the incentive to make the most absurdist, attractive, and stimulating headline possible with the goal of piquing your interest and getting you to go there. This means that the news headline may not describe what's in the actual article. Many people don't seem to know that news headlines are written not by the journalists themselves or the person writing the article, but often by the editors. And so what's in the article and what the editor has decided the article can, should say can often be very different. So the challenge then, when you're clicking on something out of your friend's Facebook feed, or even if you're looking at a traditional news article or a new news article off of some online outlet, is figuring out what exactly is credible and what's not. And in the old days, when we were looking at traditional newspapers that were professionally made, that were expensive to produce, reputation was what carried the value of the articles, right? You knew that it was going to be credible because the reputation of a newspaper would be tarnished if they published a whole lot of inaccurate stuff. That would really hurt them. If you go onto a website and they don't have a particular reputation to maintain, if it's not the New York Times, if it's instead um, some other site that doesn't necessarily have the sort of long-standing credibility and might not exist tomorrow, if they end up publishing something inaccurate, the cost is actually not that high. And what that means is that you can put anything out there, even something that doesn't really have strong enough sources, that may be actively wrong, um, without suffering as much as a producer as you might otherwise think. And in the US in particular, our libel laws aren't all that strong, right? Which may not seem like all that relevant a point, but what it means is that if somebody says something inaccurate about you, if you're a public figure, they're not held responsible for it. And that means that the reputation of the outlet is really all that's going to tell you in practice when you first encounter things whether the information's credible or it isn't all that credible. So in the contemporary environment then, what we now have is a system where instead of professional large-scale media outlets, we have a bunch of smaller media outlets that don't have the cost productions um, that they used to have, that can publish things without the kind of reputational hit that they used to have, and that are largely sharing their content via social media right, via the fact that, hey, your friend found this article and he or she posted it. And what that means is that what gets into people's head is not necessarily whatever it is that's most accurate, but whatever it is that's most shared, that seems most interesting, perhaps, um, and that draws the most attention. And so these combined processes of the change in gatekeeping from professional editors and journalists to amateurs who are now creating a lot of the content, the change in distribution from large-scale major media organizations, which did have biases, but where those biases were sort of contained, to a much more diverse but much less reputationally embedded set of outlets, and um, from consumers that are encountering news by going to look at those pieces of news versus that are encountering news because those pieces of news are shared with them that creates an environment that shifts the burden of responsibility in many ways. It shifts the burden of responsibility from professional producers and large-scale outlets with these reputations to individuals at the end of the day 
who are receiving information not because it's what professionals decided to produce, but instead because it's what they decided to select into or what their friends decided to share. Um, and those, those changes put the onus of evaluating information no longer in the source, but on the consumer. And that means it's your job. It's your job to figure out whether a piece of information is credible, how worthwhile it is, and what to make of it. And it's a lot more work for ordinary people, but it's a critical new role that we all have to play in an environment that has shifted so much.